helped found a nation. This is a leader who has said, nothing is important unless it advances that dream. Our war of independence, fought after six millions of our people have been exterminated by the Nazis, proves once again that the cause of justice faithfully pursued must triumph in the end. In our revival, we have been inspired by the message of our Bible and by the traditions of our ancient history, which elevate the dignity of man and the principle of justice, and which command us to love our neighbor. His name is David Ben-Gurion, and this is his biography. I'm Mike Wallace. This is Biography. Our story, David Ben-Gurion. Ten more like him, a rabbi once said, and Israel will be redeemed. He was describing David Green, a young man driven by one consuming ambition, to help create the independent state of Israel, to make it a homeland for his people. When David Green began this lifelong struggle, he assumed the name by which the world would later know him, David Ben-Gurion, David, son of the lion. At the age of 70, David Ben-Gurion, white mane, but tough and vigorous, issued this challenge to the people of Israel. We will build here an example to the world, he said. A nation without classes, without discrimination, fulfilling the dreams of our prophets of old. Many men have had their role in history thrust upon them. But David Ben-Gurion saw his role. Even as a child, he clearly saw his destiny. One of 11 children, David Green is born in Plants, Poland in 1886. Even as a schoolboy, young David is a rebel. He sees himself as a crusader. To his classmates, he says, one day I will be the leader of a new Israel. By the time he is 15 years old, he is a tireless organizer for the new Zionist movement, a dedicated group hoping to make a homeland for the Jews in Palestine. In 1906, at the age of 20, David Green migrates to Palestine, now controlled by Turkey. The spirit of my childhood had triumphed, he later recalls. I was in Israel, in a Jewish village, and its name was Petach Tikva, the gateway of hope. For almost five years, he thrives on working the land in remote farming villages. But in 1910, he joins the staff of the new Zionist labor magazine, Unity. He writes inflammatory editorials against Turkish rule and signs them with the Hebrew name, David Ben-Gurion, David, son of the lion. At the outbreak of World War I, the Turkish government exiled Ben-Gurion as a dangerous agitator. He flees to New York. In 1916, he meets and marries Paula Munweis, a student nurse. The Arab population far outnumbers the Jews in Palestine, and Arab influence is strong. Any proposals of partition by the British are immediately rejected by Arab leaders, who have sworn to drive the Jews out of Palestine. Out of the sun-baked waste, the raiders of El Husseini, Mufti of Jerusalem, thunder across the borders, bringing death to the unprotected Jewish villages. David Ben-Gurion leads the drive to recruit an underground force, the Haganah. 
this secret Jewish army will strike back at the Arabs. The cities of Israel become armed camps. For more than a decade, this terror will continue. March, 1939. Britain's Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain, seeking to appease the Arabs, issues a white paper, a change in policy which violates the mandate of the League of Nations. The white paper limits all future Jewish immigration to 75,000 persons. After that, not a single Jew is to be admitted to Palestine without Arab approval. The Jewish people now face a greater threat than ever before, the fear spawned by Adolf Hitler. into concentration camps, David Ben-Gurion desperately pleads with the British government to open the doors of Palestine. He knows that if he fails, millions of Jews will be exterminated. But his pleas are rejected. The white paper will be enforced. September 1939. As World War II begins, Ben-Gurion issues a statement that for years will serve as a guide for his people. We shall fight the white paper as if there were no war, and the war as if there were no white paper. Ben-Gurion forms a Jewish battalion that goes into action in Italy alongside British units. Spring, 1945. After five years of fighting, the Axis powers are defeated. Allied forces begin a task unparalleled for heartbreak in the history of man's inhumanity to man. Throughout Europe, living in makeshift camps, the pitiful remnants of the Jewish people wait. They must now seek a way to rebuild their lives. Ben-Gurion, with renewed vigor, presses his demands on the British government to admit these refugees to Israel. Israel must become an independent state, he declares, to which all Jews can come. Britain adamantly refuses to consider any changes in the white paper. Her policy in the Middle East for many years has been to placate the Arabs, even at the cost of her own prestige. British forces continue to seal off Palestine to the Jews. If we cannot bring our people in legally by day, an underground leader declares, we will bring them in illegally by night. The first crude attempt by the underground to smuggle in Jewish refugees from Europe ends in tragedy. The Exodus, caught by a British patrol, is brought into port structure ripped by shells. The Haganah, however, uses other ships to bring in refugees. They are disguised as merchant freighters, but their cargoes are human beings. The refugees cannot be seen on deck when the ship is in sight of land. They willingly endure the cramped, stifling quarters below. These are small discomforts to the survivors of Dachau and Buchenwald. The journey seems endless. There is sickness and suffering. But there is also courage and faith. probably be detected by the British, and if that happens, they will be interned at camps on Cyprus. Only a day away from Israel, they are spotted by a British plane. The refugees are hurried below decks, the hatches closed and covered. Now, 
it is certain the British have discovered the true identity of the ship. And there is no point in hiding in the suffocating hole. their beloved homeland and sing the ancient songs of their people. another time, a tomorrow when they will come home to stay. These people carry with them the words of a traditional prayer. Next year, may we be in Jerusalem. Three years of uncertainty and unrest. The future of Israel is determined by the United Nations. The British mandate over Palestine will end. In Tel Aviv, on the most triumphant day of his life, David Ben-Gurion reads the proclamation which an ancient people have waited to hear for more than 2,000 years. The state of Israel has come into being. celebrating, no one is aware of the throb of bombers winging out of the southeast, out of Egypt. May 15, 1948. The combined armies of the Arab nations, spearheaded by the crack British-trained Arab legions of King Abdullah, attack the infant nation. a war of extermination and a momentous victory boasts Azam Pasha, Secretary General of the Arab League. It will be spoken of like the Mongolian massacres and the Crusades. The outnumbered Haganah fights desperately, but within weeks Jerusalem is encircled and cut off from the rest of Israel by the Arab forces. Ben-Gurion recruits a new fighting force. 
When he is asked how this ragged army will free Jerusalem, he answers, I will find a way. I believe in miracles. Israel fights back with determination and daring. First in Jerusalem, then throughout Israel, the Jewish army pushes back the Arab legion. Within seven months, Ben-Gurion's miracle has been accomplished. Egypt asks for peace, and the fighting ends. Now, says Ben-Gurion, let our people come home. The gates of the camps on Cyprus open. By the thousands, by the tens of thousands, the refugees can now complete their journey to Israel. to the state, he declares. Israel will survive without me. Deep in the wasteland that is the Negev Desert, the former prime minister begins his retirement in the tiny kibbutz community farm of Shte Boker. David Ben-Gurion has returned to the soil. General Gamal Abdel Nasser prepares for war against Israel. His Arab legions have been strengthened with massive reinforcements, tanks and guns from Soviet Russia. The general now vows he will drive the Israelis into the sea. In this 
this new crisis, David Ben-Gurion is summoned from his place of retirement and urged to resume his duties as prime minister. At the age of 70, he accepts the challenge. On October 29, 1956, Israeli troops invade Egypt. They overrun the Gaza Strip and the Sinai Peninsula, and their drive carries them to the Suez Canal. Their sweeping victory shatters the Egyptian army and destroys Nasser's dream of conquest. World opinion, however, is against Israel. The UN censures Ben-Gurion's impulsive action and orders the immediate withdrawal of all Israeli troops. And again, there is an uneasy and impermanent peace in the Middle East. the 10th anniversary of their independence. The pioneers, the immigrants, the young Sabrim, the new generation born in Israel, can take pride in the accomplishments of a decade. The aging lion, the old man, as he is called with deep affection, has given shape and form to all their hopes, all their dreams. It was sometimes challenged during his years as Israel's prime minister. His reaction to such opposition was simple and direct. I will resign, he would say. And this was usually enough to quiet his critics. Once, he was even forced to carry out his threat. But as one official pointed out, he will be back. After all, the lion never leaves its young in danger. Mike Wallace for Biography. Day at 11.30, INN's Midday Edition wraps up a special series on managing your money with a smart way to save. 